Okay, this is um, <clears throat> going to be a short video to try to shed some light on reactants. I'm going to start with uh, inductive reactants. <clears throat> That's fairly easy to explain. Now, we all know that uh, if you've got DC, you've got... Uh, current flowing only in one direction, like so. We, uh, we know what a resistor is. In this case, I put a 12-ohm resistor across a 12-volt <clears throat> battery. And we're going to have the resistor impeding the current flow. The bigger the resistor, the more impedance uh, to current flow, uh, or the more resistance to current flow. I tend to use impedance and resistance uh, interchangeably. Uh, impedance and resistance are almost the same thing. They're measured in ohms. With the resistor, we have pure resistance. Current flow will be 12 volts divided by 12 ohms, or one amp. <clears throat> the current flowing through the resistor is going to create heat the power that's going to be created or used is I squared R, in this case, 1 times 1 times 12, or 12 watts. So we will create 12 watts of heat in that resistor. We're going to consume power in the resistor in a DC circuit. Now, we have <clears throat> a coil hooked up to an AC circuit. Now, if this was a DC circuit, current would flow through the coil. It would set up a, uh, a field, uh, a, a magnetic field around the coil, and then the current would flow unimpeded if it was DC. It'd be just like the coil wasn't there. There would be a little bit of resistive losses, a minute amount of resistive losses in the coil. Um, but uh, we, that's insignificant. Now, when we change from DC to AC, we're going to have a current flow. The current flow is going to be in one direction on the positive half of the cycle. Then it's going to be in the opposite direction uh, on the second half of the cycle. So we're going to have current flowing one way and then the other way. Uh, that, I guess that's no surprise. We'd have that if it was a resistor. But in a resistor, we would be creating heat on the first half of the cycle. We'd be creating heat on the second half of the cycle. With a coil, <clears throat> we're building up a um, magnetic field on the first half of the cycle. Then on the second half of the cycle, we're building up an opposite magnetic field. And that's going to go back and forth. It's going to alternate back and forth. The current that's going to flow, if we had a meter in the circuit, if we had a, had a AC ammeter here, the current that's going to flow is going to be determined by the AC voltage divided by the reactance. Now, the reactance, X, is measured in ohms. So, very similar to a resistor. We're going to say, ah, oh, this has so many ohms of reactance. We have such a certain voltage, so we can calculate the current that's going to flow. So that's, uh, that's pretty easy. Well, what is this X of L, this inductive reactance? <clears throat> well, you probably learned a formula 2 pi FL when you uh, passed your license test. So we're just going to say all that stuff is K. X of L equals... Uh, uh, 2 pi L times the frequency. So as the frequency goes up, gets bigger, X of L gets bigger. Inductive reactance varies with the frequency. Okay, we all know that, but how? Well, that's what I'm going to try to explain here. First off, <clears throat> during the first half of the cycle, we're going to build up a field. Now, this is a, a 
a fairly low frequency RF. Let's call it broadcast band RF. So during the first half of the lazy cycle, we build up a field. And then the, the uh, current goes to zero, and now we start to build up a field in the opposite direction. Well, to, do, to build up a field, first off, we had it going this way, and we built up a, uh, we'll just say plus minus that way. We built up a field. Well, now we're going to flip it. And we are going to, well, this isn't going to work too good. I used the wrong marker. But anyway, field's going to go in the opposite direction. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to, this field is collapsing and it's putting energy back into the system. And the negative half of the cycle is having to kind of oppose that. So all that stuff is going to kind of happen. First field is going to collapse. The uh, second field is going to build up. And then once the field is built up, current can kind of trickle on through here. And then it reverses again. So we got to wait for that field to collapse. And then we're the opposite flow of currents building up the field. And then once that field gets built up, current's going to trickle on through. So we're going to have, if we had a meter here, we would be measuring some current flow. Um, mainly the current flows once the field gets built up. If the field completely builds up and fills up, man, we got a lot of current flowing. So at low frequencies, this is kind of lazily happening. Then as we increase the frequency, the field doesn't, get built up quite as much, and then we reverse the direction, and the field collapses, and then we reverse the direction again, and we build up, we build up, we, uh, it's back and forth. Okay, wait a minute. This is happening real fast. This is happening millions of times per second. So the, the higher the frequency, in other words, the quicker we reverse the pattern here of current, the harder it is to build up the field and get current to go through there all the way. Current never... If, you, if the frequency is high enough, current never gets through there. And in that case, we say, oh, this is not exactly just a coil. It's a choke. It's choking off all current flow because due to the number of turns and, and parameters for the coil, the frequency goes higher and higher and less and less current is going to flow through that coil. Now, this is one way to think about this is suppose you're sitting in a canoe and you paddle in one direction for like a minute and you get the canoe going and you're moving pretty good. Then you start paddling the opposite direction. Well, you got to stop the canoe from moving and then you'll eventually start moving back in the other direction. So if you paddle for a minute, and then switch, paddle for a minute, switch. <clears throat> Your canoe may go, you know, five or ten feet in one direction, and then it goes, then you have to stop it. But you got time to stop it, and it goes five or ten feet in the other direction. Then you got to stop it and back and forth. So with a low frequency paddle, you know, you got time to stop the canoe and get it moving in the other direction. Well, suppose you paddle for 30 seconds and then switch. Well, your canoe isn't going to move as far in one direction. And then pretty soon you say, okay, I'm going to go to some real VHF paddling, some real super high frequency paddling. I'm going to take one stroke in one direction and one paddle stroke in the other direction. Well, guess what? Your canoe isn't going to move at all because you go one way and you don't even get the canoe moving before you try to move it the other direction. So pretty soon your canoe is just sitting there dead in the water and you're paddling like crazy going in one direction and then the other direction. Well, in that case, you are kind of generating some heat. So that's not a perfect analogy to the way this inductor works, but it's pretty good. Uh, current goes in here and the first thing it's going to do is build up a field and then it changes direction. So the field is collapsing and it's got to build up a field in the other direction. And it does that. And at a rather slow frequency, it can do all this stuff. 
as you start increasing the frequency, the current goes in there and it doesn't hardly get the field started before it switches direction. That's the point at which you have no current flow through the coil at all. So anyway, I hope this kind of gives a, another uh, uh, view of inductive reactants. Uh, it's building up a uh, magnetic field and then having to overcome that magnetic field and build it up in the other direction. Now, capacitive, um, capacitive reactants is very similar, except uh, we're more talking, describing it with voltages. <clears throat> and because the capacitor is like, you know, just uh, two plates, um, we have a situation with a, uh, with a capacitor where we have, you know, two parallel plates. They're not touching each other. And if we've got DC, DC cannot flow through there at all. When you first apply the DC to a capacitor, uh, it's going to charge up a, a field, electric field in between the capacitors. So if you've got a meter here, if you've got a, a, a current meter in circuit here, when you first connect the DC voltage, that meter may go click, flick. And it only moves during the instant it takes current or to electrons to flow in here and set up a, a field. And then there's no more current going to flow at all. It's an open circuit. Now, when you switch from DC to AC, then you're, you're building up and charging the electric field and discharging the electric field. Very similar to what we did with the inductor, except at DC, there's no current flow. As you increase the frequency, current will start to flow. And then keep on increasing the frequency. Once you get to really high frequencies, then this capacitor uh, starts to look like a short circuit. And you have a lot of current flow. So the capacitor is... The, the reactance of the capacitor, X sub C, is inversely proportional to the frequency. In other words, if the frequency is low, you got a lot of reactance. If the frequency is high, and as the frequency goes higher, the reactance gets smaller and smaller. And you might remember from your test that uh, capacitor reactance is 1 over 2 pi F C. So it's inversely proportional. As the frequency gets higher, X of C gets smaller. Whereas with the inductor, it was X of L equals 2 pi FL. So with an inductive reactance, as the frequency goes up, the X of L goes up. Directly proportional, inversely proportional. Okay, that's my quick uh, video to try to help you understand uh, reactance.